going to introduce us. Uh, my name is Estela. I'm uh, the colleague of Lean in Portugal. And with me also is uh, Lia Raquel, who is the other colleague of Lean in Portugal. And uh, we are super. Uh, <laughs> So Leaning, uh, Leaning Portugal Network is the official network of Leaning in, in Portugal, obviously. And um, we run a few circles and um, around the country. Uh, we have been having a bit quiet lately, uh, but we are, we are now back. Um, and basically, um, if you wanna join us, uh, you can find us in, um, in LinkedIn. We have a page there. Also, we have a website where we have a bit more of information, but most of the events we share them uh, through LinkedIn. Um, so it would be good. It would be good to connect there. And um, well, as you know, Leaning, leaning, um, org was started by former uh, Facebook COO, Sheryl Sandberg who is not on Facebook anymore, good. <laughs> and uh, well, the idea of leaning is to empower all women to achieve their ambitions. So for us here in Portugal, um, our, our mission is to build a sisterhood, fight bias and drive equality. Um, those are our, our values. Um, and we, we try to always have a, quite an open view of, of um, gender and be quite intersectional. That's uh, one of the things we are working hard as well on, on making everyone, one of every identity feel welcome um, in our program. And now without uh, more further ado, I will I will give the room to, to Leah, who is gonna be uh, managing the panel. Um, I'm gonna be in the background, anything, just please use the chat, give us, uh, share with us your thoughts, uh, and, and yeah, please enjoy. Thank you, Stella, for your words. Everyone can hear me? So hello, everyone. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon from everywhere uh, you are in the world. Welcome to Embracing uh, Equity, Empowering Women in the Workplace Roundtable that we have today uh, with the topic Embrace Equity. So, of course, I'm very, very excited to be uh, joined by a fantastic panel uh, today for a reflection that intends to bring together uh, perspectives from different professional spheres and talk a little bit about um, the struggle that women are facing at work and, I don't know, thinking about what, can, what, what we can do um, differently in the future and have a wonderful conversation. Um, uh, just a quickly reminder, this session is being recorded, uh, as Stella said, and uh, we are expecting we are expecting a diverse audience. And without further ado, I want to introduce our amazing panel we have today. And first, the first hub is Teresa Carvalho, um, is associate professor at the University of Aveiro here in Portugal. She is the vice dean of the Department of Social, Political and Territorial Sciences, the director of PhD program in public policies and director of Center for Research in Higher Education Policies. Uh, she was a member of the executive committee of the European Sociological Association from 2017 to uh, 2021, she was one of the founding members of uh, Women in Higher Education Management Research, uh, Research Network. She has been involved in some international research projects, uh, has gender power in management uh, across cultural analysis, and one that we all know, Change, Challenging Gender Inequality in Science and Research. Welcome, Teresa Carvalho. Tell, tell us a little about uh, yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Leah, and thank you uh, for inviting me and for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to share um, some thoughts with you and also to learn a lot with this uh, discussion today. So it's a great pleasure. I think you already said enough about me. <laughs> Maybe I can also talk a little bit uh, about me as a, a woman, as a person, and not only as a professional. 
Uh, just, yes, uh, we, we, can, we can just uh, do the presentations first and after we come back to the, to the okay. specific topics of our conversation. Can we? Okay, Thank perfect. you very much. Thank you very much for, for being uh, with us today. Next up is Carolina Morin. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Emotai. Uh, it's an amazing startup that improves human performance through the, the use of neurotechnology. In 2019, uh, she was awarded uh, Best Founder by Portuguese Women in Tech. Um, she has been featured in Wired's magazine, Hottest European Startups, and has been mentioned as a Women in Tech to Watch by Startup Portugal before founding MOTI. Uh, she was a researcher in physiological computing with applications in product design. Carolina has earned a master in biomedical engineering from Nova University of Lisbon uh, with a focus on medical imaging and signal processing. Thank you, Carolina, for being here. Can, do you want to tell us something about yourself? Hi, Leah. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess you did mention everything. <laughs> um, just happy to be here and thanks for the invite. Thank you, Carolina. Wonderful. Next up is my dear friend, Teresa Ford. He's a researcher in the field of political psychology of health and mental health communication and public policies. She has a master in clinical and health psychology from Howard uh, Coimbra University. Uh, and an European PhD in, social, in so social psychology and communication from Sapienza University from Rome in Italy as a Marie Curie, Marie Curie uh, Research Fellow. She is currently um, at the Center for Research in Neuropsychology and Cognitive and Behavioral Intervention at the University of Coimbra. Welcome, Teresa. Do you want to say something? Thank you, Leah. Hi, everyone. Uh, just following my my fellow uh, <laughs> um, colleagues. Uh, thank you for for the invite, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you. At last, but certainly not the least, is Margot Myler. Uh, he's a global community builder and a champion for women in tech. She founded the Matinova Canada Women in Tech Group. Uh, he's an advisory board member for Women in Tech Global Network and is also an advocate for digital literacy and accessibility. She's currently the global director uh, of community TopTal, focused on connecting a fully remote network of top talent around the world uh, through programming, events, pro bono work, and more. Uh, welcome, Margot. Do you want to say something about yourself? Hi, Lee Raquel. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's a great bio. I think today, um, certainly like I'm from Canada and a lot of the work that I've done around women in tech is over there. But um, the real, real relevance, I think, here and part of the angle that I can hope to bring to today's conversation is really around like remote workforces and currently being in an organization that is totally distributed around more than 80 countries gives a different a bit of a different perspective on how we can try and lift women up through that use of remote kind of work environments. So happy to, to dig into that angle with everyone here today. Thank you so much, Margot. Um, first of all, we have uh, an amazing global audience today. We are really, we really appreciate it. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, we are excited also to be here. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have some amazingly women on this panel who have generously given um, their time to just share their experience and knowledge and talk a little bit about their experience um, of how we can embrace in equity, empower women in the workplace. And as an um, introductory note, I need to mention some key findings from the last the latest women in the workplace report from McKinsey uh, in partnership with uh, with Lenin. First, uh, women uh, are still dramatically underrepresented uh, in leadership. Only one in four C-suite uh, executives is a woman, and only one in 20 is a woman of color. The second point is the broken rank is still uh, holding women back 
for every 100 men promoted from entry level to the to the manager, only 87 women are promoted, and only 82 women of color are promoted. Um, third, now um, women leaders are leaving their companies at higher rates than ever before. Um, to put the scale of the problem in the perspective for every women uh, at the director level who get promoted, two women directors are choosing to leave their company. So keeping this, um, this in mind, and uh, let's go ahead and dig uh, in a, we are going through some questions we have prepared. And so, first of all, I would love to hear uh, from whole panel, from your perspective, uh, what threats have been achieved uh, for attaining gender equality in the workplace in your area? Um, Teresa Carvalho, do you want to jump first? Yes, why not? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um... Well, um, I, I'm talking from a very specific field. I, I'm talking from the higher education field and from higher education institutions. And in fact, these institutions have been key actors and a positive force in this long journey through gender uh, equality. Uh, actually, the, we have been assisting in the last years almost all over the world, to an increasing enrollment of female students and uh, graduates, which is, in fact, quite important. Uh, but also, uh, the higher education institutions have a, a very relevant role until now, and I hope it will increase for the, the future, in producing relevant knowledge and relevant research to expose the ways in which girls and women are still discriminated against. Um, so, uh, particularly within higher education institutions, uh, we have been assisting also to an increasing recruitment of female staff, which is uh, relevant not only for the teaching staff, but also for the so-called non-teaching staff. Um, so, uh, these are very positive points, especially because we have been able through higher education institutions to um, have more women with the agencies over their lives because they have increased their qualifications and also to have more women in positions of power. In, in specifically in Portugal, uh, this has been particularly relevant because we, after half a century of, of uh, dictatorship, when the access to higher education was restricted to a, a small elite, uh, from uh, a socio uh, and economic elite, um, then we experienced a massive education expansion. And this was reflecting a fast increase in the women's participation uh, rate. Um, so the number of women increased from about 14% uh, already in, in the end of the 70s uh, to almost 16% in the 90s. And now it's a little bit less, but it's around 55% of women as uh, students in higher education institutions in Portugal. Um, and this is relevant because, in fact, it has uh, the, the female participation overshooting OECD and the European Union average. And this is also uh, relevant in other indicators, which puts Portugal in a very uh, positive situation because we actually have, uh, we are one of the countries in Europe with a higher number of female doctorates, uh, which is uh, important. But this is also true for the graduates with a master degree. Uh, the women are around 16% of the students with a master uh, degree. And in Portugal, they are also present in, uh, we have more women in non-traditional uh, fields. So we have also more women. We are one of the OECD countries with more women in so-called STEM fields. 
I think we are going to talk a lot about women in technologies today. So it's a, a good sign for Portugal, uh, these uh, indicators. Um, and actually, uh, Portugal is also one of the European countries with a higher proportion of women in research, which, which is related, obviously, with the higher number of female doctorates that we have when compared with other European uh, countries. And the, this also is um, reflected in the publications or in if we use this indicator as a, uh, a dimension for uh, having a, an idea about the performance indicator of the researchers, uh, Portugal has the smallest gender publication output gap compared with other European countries and even other international countries. So I think these are actually um, quite positive aspects of the higher education system and the uh, elimination of the gender differences in academia. I think you are already <laughs> pushing me to finish. So. <laughs> no, thank you, Teresa. And okay. after, after this, uh, this introduction, Carolina, um do you can, do you want to share your perspective because your background you have a transition between academic file to to business do you want to share your perspective yes um i it's great to see that there's so many women in portugal that are in stem uh, i did notice that a lot i i am from biomedical engineering so it does have more women uh, than men uh, when you compare it to like electronics or computer science um but what i noticed and it's something that i've been noticing for a while is that typically um they don't go for their own company so that they don't start their own startup or it's more it's less likely for them to take more risks and uh, because creating a startup is risky right only one out of ten um, go somewhere or raise the first round of investment and then from then on it's very rare um, that that they they succeed into either turning into an IPO or selling it actually um, there was an article that came out, I think it was a year ago, that only 2% of the startups that are started by women IPO, which is very small. Typically, they sell it. They sell the company eventually. Um, it's very rare for them to IPO. So I do think um, there needs to be taken some action regarding entrepreneurship, um, especially around founders. I know that there's more women joining startups that are at early stages, which is great. For example, at Emotai, we're quite an early stage startup and we have half women, half men. Uh, thankfully, even in the, we have female developers as, as well, which is hard to find, but we do have it. Um, but there are some things that need to be taken uh, into account for more people to, or for more women to start their own startups. I think it would be important to have events like these so that women find other women as a leadership role and see that so they can also become a, a woman leader. Um, for example, when I wanted to start Emotai in Portugal, there were about two to three uh, women CEOs, but that was about it. Now it's growing. There's more female CEOs, uh, but the more they show up, more is more likely for other women to apply. So I do my best to show up in every single event where I can talk and give my own perspective and just show as a woman can also start their own startup. I totally agree with your perspective. Teresa, Teresa Fort, um, do you share the vision uh, of what has been shared so far? What is your uh, in your mind about this? So I didn't want to be redundant uh, with my talk with Teresa Carval because it's the academic, it's the academia world. So it's, uh, although there are seven, we work in different fields. So I will not, I was not thinking to talk about the achievements, but of some obstacles and solutions studied by my field of studies that is the ingrained and developmental nature of some gender stereotype uh, and, and stereotype threats. Um, so when we see, I, I was when I was reading the Lenin report with the last year data uh, of on women in workplace that you that, I, that includes the concerning information Leah mentioned before, I recalled an insight from Bell Hooks in her feminist theory from margin to center from the eighties, uh, where she wrote, "quote 
the emphasis on work as the key to women's liberation led many white feminist activists to suggest women who worked were already liberated. They were in effect saying to the majority of working women, feminist movement is not for you. So when we see these general statistics, although they are empowering uh, with the silver lining, the fact is that an increased participation in the workforce, more women in leadership, a reduction in gender pay gap, uh, work-life balance improvements. So we must keep in mind that the path is not linear and for sure we all already experienced this kind of pushback. So with, um, with uh, the breakthroughs comes uh, some specific pushbacks like regarding quotas or regarding the reasons why you achieved certain positions. Uh, so I think this is a sign of an, in, an enduring social representation that these rights and the rights to, uh, to climb uh, the, the leather uh, are not uh, are not natural to women. It's like a, a, a concession. So I didn't want to, uh, Leah. How much time do I have? Because I don't want to get lost. No, you you, you can talk more. To just me. okay. <laughs> so I will I will just focus a little bit because I think we all, uh, as women and as working women and in different contexts, I think I think this is transversal. Is the idea that. Uh, we are stuck at a double, very reductive bind. So very agentic women can be sometimes perceived as rude or authoritarian, which may be the case sometimes, but not always. Uh, and highly communal women are criticized for not being effective leaders or task focused. So we know that this, these ideas and other ideas are internalized um, and affect performance and uh, an important task like decision making or negotiation. Uh, so the most common, what concerns me and what social psychology has to give to this kind of, uh, of topic, I think, is that the most common reactions to stereotype threat, so this idea, this fear that as a woman we are going to be judged negatively uh, or being put in a box, uh, is most women react, uh, the, the most common reactions are of vulnerability or um, reaction, like being reactive. Uh, and pause for a second and think of the waste of cognitive emotional resources we are having in trying to engage in this regulation to deal with feeling vulnerable and more insecure in a threatening context or to actively engage in counter stereotypical behavior uh, instead of just being you, just being like, like whenever, whatever you want to be. Um, so I'll pause for now. I'll just... <laughs> To avoid the manifesto. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Um, Margot, I, although I, I, I didn't mention, I, I know that you also have a background in, in sociology, but uh, you work, yeah, you work with a large, uh, diverse community. And how do you observe this issue? Yeah, it's interesting because, of course, there are many issues that we still have to tackle and, and the amazing experts here who are researching this day in and day out are going to have, you know, this, this really great perspective to frame that for us, I think. Um, so going maybe to more a little more like general terms, it, back to your question of what strides we've achieved or have we achieved any, you know, toward gender equality in the workplace. I think certainly like big companies like where I am that are working remotely across many countries, like certainly there have been strides that are made and even in, in some of the conversation we've seen here today. So just increased awareness, first of all, ha is happening, right? Like I think we can probably all, yes, I'm seeing nods here. Um, so primarily of gender inequality, but there is awareness of that, right? And so this has led to more um, public discussions, debates, conversations like today. So I think there's this great like start. Um, I think that there is a depth of understanding also, especially in tech around um, the fact that we can't build a diverse product unless you have a diverse team. And so that's kind of a narrative that's starting. I think will be really important. You know, you can go deep into like, if we create AI with only men from a certain country of the world, like what's that AI gonna know? It's only gonna have that one frame of reference, right? So these conversations are important and that's that's happening and being talked about. Um, and if anyone you know listening needs a business case, well, women and diverse populations have very big buying power. So your product or service um, being relevant to us as well is really important. Um, but there's also more diversity initiatives specifically out there that are happening. So many companies have launched, you know, are doing a lot this week. Happy Inter International Women's Day, everyone. You know, um, they're they're doing events at their work. They're bringing this topic up a little more, and then they're getting hopefully into the the, the deeper diversity initiatives. 
but there are things like mentorship programs that are start, we're starting to see. Um, and there, you know, there's people looking at, hey, are women in our company involved in our mentorship programs? Like, are they, are they participating? Do we have women in leadership roles that can give that mentorship? And then I think that's, you know, sparking some of those discussions a little more. So some good outreach happening. And then I think we're seeing we're seeing a, a movement on equal pay and I'd love, you know, maybe even so the Teresa or Teresa can help uh, with this in a little bit, but there's definitely more of a push for that in tech that I'm seeing, um, which has led to some, some progress in closing that, but it's, there's still, I think a lot of ways to go. And we'll talk about that today more, but um, some companies are I'm seeing are conducting like pay audits, um, addressing discrepancies that way. There's a lot of tools out there too, for those listening that are like, what can I do in that realm? There's tools that you can find called like scorecards or assessment tools. So you can actually like assess some of these criteria and see where your company's at as a baseline, which is really nice that there's those tools that are available to kind of like see where you're at before, you know, making commitments to things that you may not realize you're doing or not. And this celebrate some of the things that you already are doing that you maybe didn't realize are unique uh, to your organization. And then I think um, there's a growing number of women in leadership roles, but still a big, long way to go. So I think that these conversations are really important because I think we can also find a little bit of room to celebrate the, the pieces and, and highlight those so that others can kind of like find the roadmap to go do it the same way themselves. So, you know, pulling out those positive stories. But I think, you know, one of the next questions we're going to have here as a group too, I'm sure we'll get to is like more tangible solutions for that. But I'll recap this, you know, positive statement by saying, well, progress has been made. There's certainly still a long way to go to achieve gender equality. And, and like, especially in the tech industry and STEM, we all kind of touched on that. We're still certainly facing significant barriers and biases, particularly in terms of hiring, promotion, retention. Um, and that, you know, today's, I gave a great quote on that too. And I think it's going to take like a lot of ongoing efforts and commitments for us to get there. But, um, and this is also where I think, the remote workplace should see a nice movement for us on that because you know and I'll get talk about this more later too but there's a there's a little more level playing to set like an inclusive workplace culture um, because a lot of things are asynchronous and hiring is done totally remotely and so I think in the the atmosphere that I'm working in in this realm of the of totally remote um, countries across or totally remote companies across many countries and cultures um, I think it, that's helping push that bar a little bit as well. So curious to see what that movement continues to do. Thank you, Margot. And on the same thread, Margot, uh, do, do you want to talk a little bit to what can be done to guarantee that women are fairly represented in positions um, of leadership in both public and commercial sectors? And because I think that's gonna be a big topic for a lot of people uh, here in the call. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's increasingly important that we have women leaders that are working in companies that prioritize flexibility. So the, the, this is the expectation of the company to prioritize flexibility, prioritize employee well-being and diversity and equity and inclusion, because we know like the data is showing and in the great report that you've put out with Lean In, um, that women and especially young women like want to work for organizations where they see all of those things already available within that company. And that's what's going to make them like either like sign on in the first place or stay with you longer term. We need women to stay longer term so we can move them into those leadership roles, right? So companies have to do something. That's kind of the bottom line. Um, I did a lot of work with Women and Gender Equality Canada to complete research around like supporting women in the tech industry. And we ran roundtables, we gathered like a lot of the, the amazing, you know, research techniques that I'm sure many people here have used. We gathered a wealth of secondary research, we compiled the data, all this. And there were two really main things that came out in this Canadian research, which was um, that women are really looking, women in tech, it was specifically in tech, are looking for two key things, which was community involvement to help them feel like they had a group with them. And then the second was corporate change. So community involvement would be things that allow women to network with others in their field, things like today, which is fabulous, um, feel like they're part of something larger. It's a support system, if you will. So mentors, women like them, people navigating the same challenges. Even if a company was taking actions, if they didn't feel, if they still felt like they were totally alone, especially in technical departments, then there was still like a gap there where they couldn't totally foster that feeling of belonging and like worthiness. And then I think the company action side, this is, a, and I can give some clear examples here, but this is a great place to start. And to anyone like listening in leadership at a company, 
you can start by examining your current practices, like I was alluding to before. Um, use some of those kind of scorecard tools. You can begin to form a strategy then around inclusive hiring and those pay gaps and advancing leadership roles and again celebrating success. So I'll give some quick examples of takeaways because I know if you are a company here listening, going, what can I do? People love that. So um, look first at like the marketing materials of your company. Are you using gender neutral language? And you could do this pretty quickly, like get a coordinator on your marketing team to skim your website and go, are we, are we using gender neutral language? Um, so your website's great. Your careers page is certainly very important. Look at your job descriptions. These are things like in English, we use words like, you know, we're looking for a rock star for this role, or we need a chairman for the for our board. Use chairperson or don't use rock star because a lot of people picture right away a male rock star. That's the first thing we picture. So use like use all star or something. Just use like a simple like a different term that doesn't. And then these are small little mistakes, but we already know, like I'm sure we've all heard the statistics of women who read a job description and unless they have like 80 or 90% of this of the items, they won't apply. Men will apply with like less than 60%, many of them, of the of the criteria, they'll still apply. So there's this like bravery difference that Carolina kind of touched on already, right? So if your job description on top of that is written with many words that would resonate more with a man than a woman or make a woman feel even more like she's not a fit for that job description, you're, you know, then that's when you, that's when companies run into the thing where they say, well, it's tech and there's just, women just didn't apply. So it's not our fault. Ah, but like, what did you do even before the applying, right? Did you look at the words you're using and things like that? So like, that's one easy thing that you could go do right away. Another thing I think is having policies in place to encourage women to move into leadership roles. So does your company have a program where a senior manager mentors a female staff member to encourage their growth within the organization? Does the company have women in senior leadership positions at all? Like you, again, you can do a quick assessment and this is not to make anyone feel bad, right? Like there's organizations where those things aren't in place yet, but do that assessment because then ask yourself those questions. Then you have a place to start from, right? As opposed to feeling like maybe this is really daunting when we have these kind of conversations. Um, so, so these are all important aspects of the workplace that you can reflect on um, that'll help hopefully with long, long term with recruitment, but with also retention of your female staff. Um, and really giving your team the tools. I mean, internal training can also be very relevant, um, but I don't have a specific example to give today here. But so I think hopefully that's a few good examples. I mean, I can share a scorecard example that gives more that gives more examples. But um, I mean, I think we're going to get probably much more great advice here today, too. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Margot. Um, Teresa Carvalho, considering the, the, the projects you have been working on, um, I, I bet you are no longer at the position uh, in, in opinion stage, but at the stage of uh, demanding uh, urgent measures. Uh, what would you like to share about this? Uh, what can be done to guarantee that women are fairly represented? Well, let me first start by saying that I've started with a very positive picture of the Portuguese situation, but we all know that there is a but, <laughs> as always. And as uh, Carolina said, one of the reasons why Portugal is always uh, so nice in the picture, for instance, related with the participation of women in STEM, is because it includes the science, technologies and engineering. And women are in fact the majority in areas as biology or chemistry, but then they are less well represented in the engineering and technology field. And this is actually true. And also we have a uh, uh, high participation of women uh, has, uh, in higher education and then as graduates, but then they also face more difficulties in the labor market. And this is also true for higher education when we talk of them as institutions, because in fact, uh, uh, Portugal also has one of the uh, one uh, indicator that is less well is that we have a, a high uh, uh, level of precarity of precarious working conditions in academia and actually we are one of the countries where the proportion of women under precarious contracts is higher in Europe so we and 
we also have uh, obviously the same tendencies for having less women in top positions. Women in Portugal uh, are only only 13, 30 percent of the heads of institutions in higher education are women. So it's the same as in the other uh, in the other fields. And this is important because actually one of the most important things we can do to start uh, uh, changing this is uh, to make people aware of the situation. Um, for instance, in higher education institutions, this is quite uh, uh, usual. Uh, people tend to look at the institutions as if they are somehow apart from the society, and if they are ruled by other values and other norms. So you include everything in a meritocratic and excellence uh, framework, and then uh, you just forget that there are a lot of other um, particular characteristics and social uh, um, conditions that also uh, influence these. So this is quite important. Um, also, uh, we need to improve, obviously, uh, the work-life balance. And this is particularly relevant for both. So for everyone within the institutions. It, it's, we need to deconstruct the representation of the leadership positions as being so related with the dominant masculine values. Because you expect that someone in a leadership position has, uh, well, lives mainly for their work and is uh, always available. And uh, this needs to be deconstructed both for women and men to live their lives, more balanced lives. Um, so I, I think it's really important to deconstruct this and the, to, to show, uh, as we have just heard, what are the costs of inequality for the institutions, what they are uh, losing if they are not able to, uh, to improve the, the gender equality within their uh, institutions. But I think what... Um, still makes the difference is the political will and the institutional will. Because when we have political rules, uh, people um, change. Uh, for instance, we have now in higher education this uh, imposition that, that uh, um, the European Union associates the founding of research with gender equality. So only those in research institutions that have a gender equality plan can apply for founding. And this made all the institutions start thinking about gender equality and what can I do too. So uh, at, if we wait for everyone to be gender aware and to start changing the mentalities, it will obviously take longer. So if we have political will and we associate the founding rules with gender equality, it's a, a very um, good way to force institutions to move. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Carolina, you, you probably identify yourself with some points uh, with Margot and, and, and that Margot mentioned and, and Teresa. And how, how do you feel about this so with your both perspective? Um, I think it's a bit different when it comes to when you're a startup founder. Um, having work-life balance, unfortunately, is not a thing, <laughs> at least in the beginning. Um, and that is something that I am always honest about so that people know what they're getting themselves into. So in the first few years, you're going to have to work a lot after dinner, probably uh, weekends included, um, which is, I, as I said in the beginning, something that makes women not want to apply as much because if they want to start a family, this is uh, very difficult unless you have a very supportive partner. Um, so unfortunately for women, it's a bit harder 
Um, what I will say is there's also another issue with women as founders where you have to be sometimes extremely confident. So you have to go and pitch, talk in front of an audience. And uh, sometimes we as women are often, especially in Portugal, I, I would say, are to be more humble or more quiet. And when you're a startup founder, you need to be loud, right? People need to be looking at you. They need to be looking at what you're saying. So you need to catch their attention and you need to do that by speaking loudly and being confident on what you are saying. You have to be determined. And uh, that sometimes can be harder. I struggled with that a little bit in the beginning. Um, what I, that is something that can be easily fixed and like the work-life balance. <laughs> There are many VCs that provide mentorship and um, programs that are dedicated just for women that provide mentorships that will let you, that they will learn how they could potentially um, manifest them way because you're technically assuming a role. It's like you're kind of being an actor, right? No CEO is really like that all the time. They're just really loud and really confident and like portraying this character that they are extremely knowledgeable and they will change the world. Like you can be that for a few minutes uh, at a day, but not the entire day. Everyone has doubts, right? <laughs> but for those minutes, you need to be the most confident person in the room. So you need to practice that um, and also get it in a way that it's not too cocky because what happens often with women is if we portray ourselves as being very determined and we know what we want, then we are arrogant right? We know too much and no one can say anything. But if we don't speak loud enough, then we aren't a good founder because we don't know what we want. So you need to kind of find the in-between. And I'm still trying to find it. <laughs> it's not easy, uh, but it will be as you live and you learn. Um, I've been accused often of being too insecure in my questions just because I ask questions to learn. Whilst a male founder, if he asks questions, it's like, oh, he's asking for help. What an amazing founder. He wants to learn more. But if I do it, I come off as I don't know what I want. So typically what I do now is I ask a question with the answer already in it so that they know that I know what I want. I'm just asking for your opinion in what you want to say, but I'll do what I want. <laughs> Those are some tricks that you kind of need to learn. It's kind of stupid that you need to do those types of tricks and you can't just be yourself um but it's a game and uh, i guess we all have to play it <laughs> but i highly recommend the mentorship sessions from vcs playfair capital does them often thank you carolina you, you just you don't need to play the game you need to play the game perfectly <laughs> this is the problem um Teresa, Teresa Ford. Uh, you have a, a background as a, as we know in the public sector that um, made you observe uh, many dynamics of oppression uh, in uh, different kind of oppression um, kinds of oppression but in your opinion what can be done to guarantee that uh, women are fairly represented um now I was in a different train of thought. I was just with so many questions to Margot, Teresa, and Carolina. And while Carolina was uh, speaking, I, it seems like a, a method actor, like Marlon Brando preparing for a role and like with such a, a huge, uh, but I understand it. And it's not stupid to, to have those tricks to kind of, but I, there's a silver lining in research about, uh, Leah, just to, um, I, I will go back to your question. Uh, um, because actually, and picking uh, Theresa's uh, idea of deconstructing leadership, so and also Margot's idea of a gender-neutral presentation, so if you have certain terms that are heavily charged with male-dominant features, maybe deconstru you can deconstruct it to its core and its social influence. We're talking about social influence. And if we think about it, the key aspect of social influence is a behavior style that is adopted by wants to take the lead, and the perception that those who follow have of that style. So it doesn't have to be leadership to court. It can be a uh, more, and uh, research shows that styles that have been systematically confirmed as efficient are those characterized by agender notions, such as consistency, 
flexibility, like Margot was also uh, saying, autonomy and effort. So these four features are not gender specific. And you, and if you think of, of, of being effective and also communal, I, I think they are manageable. I have one um, curiosity because both Margot and Carolina work in, uh, in tech, right? And tech is deeply connected to STEM professions, right? They are intertwined. And uh, I, I, there's a thing um, system the, the, across the academic spectrum, uh, women are underrepresented in fields whose practitioners believe, and tech is also here involved, that raw innate talent uh, is the main requirement for success. And women are often stereotyped as not possessing a talent, an innate talent. It's like, we only work, we are like ants, uh, like with the, the great efforts. What do you, can I just make this question just a curiosity? Because it's, I think it's ingrained in our society, society this idea of a, a, a Renaissance man and not Renaissance person and um, a talent as more uh, male uh, related. The two, Carolina or Margot is. Uh... Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we can both probably add to this. It's interesting because, you know, you're right. That is happening. There is that bias. Absolutely. Um, I think that there's, and there's research to show it too, right, around certain skills that maybe we adhere more to women and, and adhere more to men. You know, some of the things that we say about women are that they have, you know, higher empathy, they're better, they can be better leaders because they are more um, in tune with like what people on their teams are in need of, and they're there to support them nice. in, in stronger ways. So, okay, those things, like those characteristics that might seem, you know, not so great on one side, like to, so, you know, the example that Caroline is giving of like, I have to show that I know my nice. stuff, you know, but <laughs> also our, our characteristics that really make a great leader. And then in the tech side of things, the funny, like the, not funny, but like the silly thing about that statement that, that people are making that, that like in, innate bias that they have around like women in tech roles just won't be as good. They're just not ready for it in the same way. Well, one of the highest strengths that women have is problem solving. Like we're really good problem solvers. If you, and then I bet you, if you, without saying that first, if you ask these same people, well, what's one of the main skills that you need your team members to have in tech, like engineers who are really good at their jobs, I bet you they'll say problem solving. So it's like the, the data is there that we have the skills that they actually need in those roles. And in fact, in fact, many of them will beat out men in the skills that you actually need to be good at that function. And then we can all learn a new, a new topic. Like we can yeah. all go to school and learn how to do something, but those like those innate skills actually arguably we would have them in higher ways <laughs> if you look at them what the data is saying. So, you know, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me to give you, but but uh, it's it's certainly a problem that still exists. And it's just like, you you just need to like give that business case more times to the right people in leadership to hopefully have them realize that that's just totally built in bias that they're feeling. I think if I can add, uh, I think it's also because typically um, from what I've noticed, of course, this is only from the experience that I've had, is that women have a tendency of not speaking so much of their accomplishments because that's what talent is, right? Uh, how do you know if someone is talented? It's probably because they are saying it somewhere, either they have like an article written about them or they show up on LinkedIn saying all these things that they've done and that people think, oh my God, so talented. But it's typically a man doing that, not women. So we need to, women need to do that more often, gain more confidence in what they are doing and talk about it. It's not bad that we should be proud of something that we have accomplished. And I would often um, say that my accomplishments were from luck, but it's not from luck. It's because I worked hard. So I am talented. So mm. I need to go public and say all of these accomplishments that I've done, some people might find it too cocky, but other ones will kind of start to see you as talented. And that's how you form that word yes. and connect it with women as well. Yeah, I, I think that sometimes we need to, to define a line between talented and um, a kind of um, a, a fake performatic uh, self-promotion. And this is the problem that I see with too many too many self-promotion inside the social networks, you know? But this is an, another discussion, okay? I, I, I already discussed this with Teresa, so uh, 
another time we will we'll talk about this. Teresa, that's, uh, we can go. Yeah, so returning to, to returning now to our um, key findings from the licensed women in the workplace report from, from McKinsey, um, we know that uh, only one in, in 10 women uh, want to work mostly on site and many women point to remote and hybrid work options as one of the top reasons for joining or staying with an, with an organization. And women of color, for example, and women with disabilities are about 1.5 hex as likely to experience demeaning and ordering, uh, ordering uh, microaggressions when they work mostly on site as opposed to mostly remotely. And um, we can assume that uh, remote and hybrid work means uh, a game changer for for women. Do you agree? Um, Teresa Fort, we have talked a lot about this issue over the last years. Uh, do you want to start? Sorry. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I, I because my train of thought always goes to the negative side. So I'll just start with the negative and then we'll... Uh, because I, I have this side, it's a game changer, of course. And as Margot was saying in the beginning, uh, it has in it has enormous enormous potential. Uh, but I I I try to focus more on, uh, and maybe it's the cultural context, maybe it's Portugal uh, and other uh, less empowering uh, contexts. But the truth is that I, I, actually I conducted a study with colleagues from University of Aveiro, uh, where uh, during the pandemic. So it was like the, the setting where we studied this, this kind of uh, emotional burden on women and men. Uh, and the emotional burden on women was far significantly higher, especially those who had kids, because the, the division of labor at home was still um, uh, obsolete. So although this is a game changer, I think that some uh, the institutions need to have provisions to protect um those it, it may be men also, but I, I think that mostly will be women uh, that can be burdened by uh, by staying at home and and dealing with the domestic tasks. So now for the more positive and solutions. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah, Margot, you work in a totally remote company. The positive perspective start now. What do you want to talk about your personal experience. Yeah, yeah. From personal experience, for sure, there's a lot that I can share. Um, I mean, we have an extremely flexible workplace um, and it has, so it's totally remote. We have more than people in more than 80 countries all working together like a regular day. I work on a project with at least five, six different countries, uh, people in different countries involved, um, men and women. And um, it's, I think this, we have this flexible workspace with, with this kind of more modern mindset of like really focusing on getting the job done and not hours worked in front of a manager who can see it. And this is obviously like a really big conversation that's been happening over the last couple of years because of the pandemic. Um, and, are, you know, fortunately, I'm in a space where we've been doing this since the company opened 11 years ago. So as a result, we have the necessary flexibility to tackle some of the obvious hurdles that women might face, like expectations of child pickup, grocery shopping and errands outside of peak hours to be able to get some stuff done that you need to do, medical appointments during the day and so on. There's, there is a ton of flexibility for that because again, we're looking at, did you get the work done? We're not looking at hours because half the people I work with projects on are working while I'm sleeping. So there is no like, you know, did you do it before 4 p.m.? Like there is no 4 p.m. because everyone in the project has a different 4 p.m., right? So we're really lucky with that, but it also is, and, and it's this kind of like, it is a little more modern, but it certainly works. Like if we can find a way to get that into more companies, this idea of like getting the work done as opposed to watching someone's hours, I think we'd be like really far ahead. I think it's still true that tech and finance are male dominated industries. Um, but and even, you know, even in our industry, certainly, like if you look at our, our number of engineers, like I'm sure there are still many more than men. And so the, we all have room to, or probably many more men than women. We all have room to grow and improve on this, right? Like, even though I'm sitting here talking about this, I'm not running our HR department. I'm not running our recruiting and there's still, you know, and they're looking at this, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. So, um, no one's perfect, but, um, we certainly operate in those industries and we really have this mindset of, 
people can be top talent regardless of their demographic or where they live or where their where their, what their religion is or what their sex is and that's a little more uncommon to find but certainly it, it works like we do have many female leaders my boss and my boss's boss are both women in our department and we're in the operations department like it's not as though we're in you know what a stereotypical department of some kind so that's really um you know exciting and i think in the leading report there were great stats about how you know only one in ten women mostly want to work on site many women want to work hybrid or remote and one of their top and it also is one of their top reasons for joining an organization and staying there because it gives them that flexibility and then the really an amazing thing also called out in the report is around like microaggressions and higher levels of psychological safety that women feel when they are in that remote environment a woman that I had on a panel recently, I was I was in the other in Leah Raquel's role, and um, we were asking about. She's a total freelancer, works you know works on her contract on her own, works totally remotely, and for her, a really great anecdote that she gave was that she feels like she can spend more of her day just working on the things she wants to work on, rather than having to kind of feel the stress of those microaggressions or feel that impact on her day. Um, but on top of that. She said to me, I, there's times I want to, I want to be part of the solution. I want to address those things happening, but I want to do it when I'm ready to do it. Not just like any time throughout my day that someone feels like, you know, inserting that into my day. So she said she has like a lot more time when she's in a remote environment to just focus on the work, to prove her value, to prove that she has the skills regardless of her gender, even though she might be in tech, but she is in tech. Um, so I think that, that that was a great anecdote. And I think we're like when I kind of open my opening statement today, like I think we're going to start to see that improvement in what remote work can do for women in leadership roles kind of as we continue to, to move through that. I think it's clear that, you know, companies can't just rely on remote work and hybrid work as a solution. They still need to invest in a truly inclusive culture because that, you know, if, if it's really negative, like you're still going to have that. Um, we had a guide that we put out at the beginning of the pandemic around um, like how to create a remote work environment and like what kind of like it was basically a playbook because we've been doing it since long before the pandemic hit. So I can share that in a chat. It's got it's just online and free and has amazing like section headers. We can just jump to the stuff that your organization might need because a lot of people are trying to put that in place right now, like trying to do the remote work or hybrid work. And this guy like some really, really genuinely great tips in there. But um you know, if I have another minute, like the other things are when we know young women really care deeply about the opportunity to advance. And they and we also just said that there was that stat of women want to work at a company that's remote or hybrid. So it's a good business decision to do that, to open up your organization to that. Um, and any organization that really is going to increasingly prioritize like flexibility is going to increasingly get more female employees in, in those roles and get them and to stay, unlike those stats Leah Raquel was giving earlier about how you know, one woman gets promoted and two are leaving. Um, and part of it's that. So solution wise, allow remote work and flexible work schedules. It's a key driving factor to both recruit and retain top talent. Um, you know, another solution is to an, like another effect of that will be that you're going to limit, um, start to limit that bias because there's a much higher uh, focus on, and, and expectation around work output rather than hours. And so that's going to also help because if the output's there, you're not looking at the sex, you're just getting the work in to your inbox, right? Um, there's going to be like, I think, a, extra help and kind of movement there. And then it's an opportunity to for the women on the other side to have more space to work without judgment and really, um, you know, feel like they can put their best foot forward. So I think a ton of, and just literally more time to be with your family, to not commute, to do those errands during the day if there's flexibility, and then be able to really focus on work when it makes the most sense. So, you know, the the employees win and the company wins uh, if that environment is done correctly. Thank you, Margot. Um, Teresa Carvalho, despite what has been shared, um, it is important that employees who choose remote or um, hybrid work receive uh, the same support and opportunities as on-site on -site employees. Uh, do yeah. you want to, to add some inputs about this question? Yes, obviously, it's uh, fundamental that uh, institutions uh, have take care of all the employees in the same ways and uh, create a, a good environment for everyone to try to be more inclusive. 
but despite all the advantage that we have heard and that we have been talking about, I think in um, I, I'm more with Teresa Ford in this <laughs> because actually the the data that we have until now taking for specifically for the higher education field, we have just starting uh, thinking seriously about this with the pandemic uh, situation, obviously that forced everyone with the lockdown to be at home. But we have studies that have demonstrated that uh, during this time, uh, especially in 2019 and 2020, um, the uh, productivity of women decreased a lot when compared with men. So women at home um, obviously still have uh, the burden of taking care of the family, and especially when they have young uh, children, obviously, and they uh, tend to uh, produce less. So it's more challenging for women to stay at home. Uh, during these two years, men published two times more than women. So it's a lot. Uh, so this can be one side effect of working at a, a distance. But I think there's also another uh, thing that is important, uh, which is the fact that uh, institutions are also political institutions in a certain way. So we have all the informal side, the informal culture of the institution, then when we are online is more difficult uh, to uh, enter into. And we know, for instance, in higher education that uh, an important uh, feature for women to get into the top positions is to be included in the right networks. So when they uh, are able to, to get in specific networks within the institution, they are able to get mentors, to have uh, someone sponsoring them uh, and supporting them to, to go for a, a leadership position. And when you start and do all your work online, it's much more difficult to get into this informal culture of the institution and to uh, be more visible for the institution to be um, available to, or to, as Carolina was saying, uh, how do you demonstrate your talents if you produce less than men and you are not visible in the institution? So uh, it's, it's quite challenging, although I recognize the advantage and uh, Marco didn't mention an important advantage, which is for the environment and for the sustainability of the, the planet. That is also important, obviously. So I'll just, just let me uh, has to, to Caroline after all, everything that you have been hearing. Um, what do you, want, do you want to share uh, in your daily contest? your daily context. For example, regular feedback and communication can have a relevant impact in this topic, for example. Um, uh, yes. So I have a different perspective where is technically uh, emotized mentors or my mentors and uh, shareholders <laughs> that provide this type of feedback. Um, I'm actually very grateful to have two women uh, investors in uh, our cap table, which is amazing and extremely rare, uh, even though now it's becoming more and more com common to have women VCs. Typically, my best conversations are with other strong women um, VCs and shareholders in our cap table. Um, so I do think feedback is really important, especially because sometimes it's hard to hear it when it's not someone that has had the same experience as you. Um, so for example, even talking with other female founders, I find it extremely important to share uh, similar experiences. We kind of notice that everyone kind of goes through the same, the same things. Everyone goes through the same problems uh, with either Mandy C or maybe co-founders. Um, 
So I do think that uh, communication and feedback is uh, really important. Um, I will also comment on the remote working. At Emotai, we have a hybrid uh, method or actually extremely flexible. You decide what you want to do. Um, we work on a Scrum um, basis, so we don't care if you're not online right now, as long as the task that you had to do was finished by the date that you said you were going to do it, no one cares. <laughs> and I think that's really important. We don't have anyone, uh, we don't have a, a female engineer working with us that has kids, but we do have a man and uh, he does need to go pick up his kids from daycare and stuff like that. And we give him total freedom to do so by being remote working or hybrid and he really appreciates it and it makes um, my job much easier. I don't want to micromanage. That's not the point of being a good leader. Uh, a good leader just chooses the best employees and then trusts trust them completely. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you, Carolina. Stella, how are you there? Do you want to, to say something about this topic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was waiting for to hear from everyone, but yeah, I wanted to share um, regarding the remote working something also um, that that Margot uh, was saying, and one thing is really important. I would say I I used to work remote even before the the pandemic, and and I resonate a lot of things that that they were saying Margot and, and also Teresa. I was remote, but there was a team on site, so for me I wasn't that visible because I was. Uh, working from a different country um, and most of the team were located in one place so I had that but the other thing that I observed it was that despite the company pretending to be into the flexibility and all of this the underlying culture of the company was about uh, overworking so there was so much flexibility there were no boundaries so uh, people thought that they had to work on the weekends. And then they did, they, so basically, if you didn't show up uh, on an evening event at 8 p.m., which is your family time, people will look at you like you are not very really interested. Um, if you, uh, for example, took holidays, uh, when like, you can take all the holidays you want. Yes, you can, uh, in theory, but when you take them, uh, people look at you like you are not enough interested. So there was a lot of underlying, like so. The, so you know, it, the, there was that that misalignment between what we pretend we were and what we really are, and um, and it was the people were totally oblivious to that, and that caused a lot of women to leave the company or getting fired because saying and asking questions and challenging the situation and it was very difficult to to keep that you know like so it, there was so much flexibility that it was basically back, backstabbing uh, everyone and and this is what i wanted to share so when we talk about yeah um remote work is positive uh it's positive when done right when they could the, when when there is a lot of clarity about the culture of the company, oh, and, and this is the this is one of the problems that some companies say they don't uh, they value this or that, but then in reality, to get a promotion, uh, you need to do something different that is not written anywhere, which is like send emails at eleven in the evening to show that you are really working, and send emails on the weekends so to show everyone you are not taking weekends off because you are so into, and this is the problem, and this is the problem, and and this. This this is not, and one of the things that I'm also seeing is that this overworking, this is the culture of overworking, and and the glorification of overworking. I'm actually writing about that because, in my opinion, it's a way to exert power. And uh, because I what I shared also before on on the on the chat about the way technology has been forged into a mask into the masculine identity, who can really work? over time, who can really be at eight in the evening, who can really be on the weekends. If you are a mother, it's, it's quite challenging to do that, right? So it's a way to exert power and again, claim the, the, the workplace as a, um, as, a, as a place for men. And this is one of the things that, that pisses me off about this uh, overworking culture. That is a, it's another way to push women away from the workplace, to say, this is not your place. 
just go, you have other priorities. You are not committed to your career. So I think this is really important for companies to put that line and to make sure they don't, they don't accept that, that behavior of the pretending to work extra hours, right? I think what Margot was saying, you need to be efficient. It doesn't, why you need to work 60 hours a week? It doesn't make sense. You need to, to do your job quick and fast and, and you know what I mean? So this, this is the, the change of mentality that needs to happen, not only send everyone remote, but also change the culture of the company. Uh, that's, that's my, I just wanted to share that. I, I will not say nothing because I, I want to be uh, neutral in this debate. So um, I don't know if we, we are running out of time. I don't know if you want to, to sh say something or uh, give some advice to our audience. Someone wants to I, share I something? I just want to, to add something to what Stella said now that I think is quite relevant. The, the question is also about um, the self-regulation, which is um, particularly uh, relevant for the, the for working in higher education, because as a research, you really don't have a target as a, or an objective as um, as a productivity target. So you you really never know what is uh, uh, expected from you and where to stop. And this is also a very relevant issue because in some specific tasks, it is probably easier than in others to work uh, from a distance because it's um, easier to, to frame what you, you need to do and when. In the others is, is more difficult and you tend to push yourself even without the institution pushing you to, to always do more and work more because you never know when is enough, I think. Just, just to add, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa Carvalho. Uh, just finishing, finishing up, I'm sure we are all thinking about uh, your shares. Uh, we have talked about so many things that intersect um, with each other. I want to thank you uh, for your time and the time those who were uh, here with us today. I want to, to deeply thank, thank you to your partners for their con continuous support and remind um, that this year the global campaign, campaign team uh, for the International Women's Day is Embrace Equity. So this means that we can all change gender stereotypes, can call out discrimination, draw attention to bias and seek out inclusion. This is about uh, collective activism. So thank you very much and see you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you very much. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. All right, I'm gonna close the call now. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the recording and.